I've had a fantastic week. Uh, we had, this week was district assembly, and for those of you who may be new to Nazarene world, it happens once a year, and the churches from this district, which encompasses about 83 churches from Nashville to Memphis, gather together for a time of celebration and worship and kind of hold each other accountable. And it's a real pleasure to get to represent you guys again and celebrate the good things that God's doing all across Tennessee, but especially what he's doing here. On Thursday night, your children's pastor, Rochelle Clark, was ordained in a very sacred and precious time. Yeah, yeah. So... I want to thank those of you who came to be a part of that. If you weren't able to do so, please uh, make it a point to see her in the next few days and uh, voice your congratulations to her. Um, I think that's all no. I need to cover. Uh, what's that? It's not all. What else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a great day yesterday for the Grace Riders. We went on about a 90-mile motorcycle ride, had a blast, kept the shiny side up the entire time. It was wonderful. Um, so if you were at a motorcycle, see Russ, because we'd like to have you be, come be a part of that group. This is going to be kind of uh, revealing of the kind of movies that I like, but I think the greatest scenes in cinematic history all involved a fight. Yeah. I mean, just think about it. Like Rocky and Drago, or Rocky and Apollo Creed, or Rocky and Tommy Morrison, or Rocky and the nursing home champion, which hasn't come out, but I'm sure it will before it's all over. Uh, you got <laughs> you got Batman and the Joker, or one of the greatest fight scenes of all time, Happy Gilmore and Bob Barker. <laughs> yeah. And then the movie Braveheart's like full of them, right? And uh, has everybody seen Braveheart? Great movie. The setting is the 14th century, and the English have invaded Scotland. Um, the Scots are kind of reeling, they're on their heels and they're disorganized and they want to fight but they don't have any leadership and nobody's really rallying the troops and then up to the fore steps William Wallace and he garners the support of uh, Robert the Bruce and there's this great scene where uh, it's in an open field and the battle lines are drawn and uh, William Wallace has got all these guys that are you know really untrained and all that but they're fighting for their country their nation and they're fired up and they're passionate and they're ready to follow him on the other side you've got the English army and they're all you know they're suited up and they've been trained and all that so they meet in the middle of this field and the representative of the tyrant Longshanks is, is trying to put forth the terms of surrender to which William Wallace answers, gives a response that basically says, uh, we're not here to surrender. We're here to fight. And then it's on and you know, things get crazy and it's really good. But, um, or more recently, the movie Iron Man 3. Anybody seen that yet? Yeah. yeah. Very cool scene where uh, um, Stark, what's his first name? Tony Stark. Yeah, very arrogant. He's a pretty cool character, right? He gets on public television after he gets, you know, gets up in a lather about what's happening and, and he calls out the enemy and literally says, this is my address and if you want to fight, you know where to find me. And in the very next scene, his house is getting blown up. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Lots of drama. But it seems like there's always somebody looking for a fight. And it doesn't matter if it's like that in the movies or if it's in real life and it doesn't really matter what, what you do for a living. You, you, we, we always encounter people who seem like they're just ready to fight. That's why I don't think I could ever be like a customer service person or complaint desk. Because you, I mean, it takes a special person to do that, right? Because every day you wake up knowing, I'm going to take it on the chin today. Everybody that calls me is going to be upset about something. I got to figure out how to field all that. God bless you if you do that. You're wonderful. Uh, Miss Charlotte was telling me this last Wednesday, you know, she, she's the director of transportation out at Fort Campbell, so she runs a bus barn there, and they're doing all that work in the summer, trying to prepare for the start of the new school year, right? They, they're doing all the zoning and figuring out where the bus routes are going to be. They don't have all that finished yet, but some irate parent called, and it was evident right from the, like, the start of the conversation on Wednesday, they weren't after answers, they just wanted to fight with somebody, and Charlotte ended up the unfortunate person on the other end of the line. People just seems like, and you know, you can always tell when they're kind of in that mode. And it doesn't matter if you're watching a political debate or you work in a school and somebody makes a, an appointment to see the administrator. You can tell when somebody shows up ready for a fight. In Luke chapter 10, we get a story where there's a guy, he's, he's called an expert in the law, but uh, 
thanks to Luke, which sometimes, you know, you see people's actions in the scripture and you got to kind of wonder, wonder what was going on in their mind when they were doing that, when they were saying that. But every once in a while, we'll get this little gem of insight from the biblical writer that will give us a key and a clue as to what their frame of mind was. This is one of those texts. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to Luke chapter 10. And uh, we're going to start at verse 25. I'm going to be kind of in and out of the scripture today, so you remain seated as we deal primarily with the, for now with just this first verse. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up. Here's the motive. To test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, on the sur surface of things, if you're watching this scene, you might just see a, a guy that appears to be well-meaning asking a question because he wants to know the answer. Not, that's not what's happening here. And we know that because Luke specifically tells us the only reason he's there, he's wanting to put Jesus to the test. In other words, it's like he's drawing a line right there. He's creating a battle scene, a, mat a battle of the wills, of the minds. And he's saying, it's us versus them, me versus you. There will be a winner and there will be a loser. I'm going to put you to the test. Funny thing about Jesus. Oftentimes, when folks showed up to him wanting to draw a line of division... He just got out a bigger pencil. And he drew a circle of inclusion. So what he does is he says to the guy, what do you think? He gives him an opportunity to get it right. And lo and behold, if this expert in the law, he really is an expert. He combines two scriptures. One's out of Deuteronomy, one's out of Leviticus, but he gives the right answer. The greatest commandment is to love God and to love other people. And in response to that, Jesus is like, you're right. And I can just, I don't know if this really happened or not, but I can imagine it. Like this guy, stand up, Robert. The guys want, come here. He comes to Jesus, come here, come right over here. He's like squared off with him, toe to toe, right? He's wanting to, tell me, teacher, what's the greatest law? And he answers the question, and Jesus is like, you got it right. And he, thank you, you can have a seat. He, he totally takes a hostile situation, or what could be, and he diffuses it. My brother has a term that he uses a lot. My older brother. He's my big brother. And uh, I seriously do call him when I need advice and stuff. He's like the ideal older brother. I love him like crazy. And uh, he has a phrase that he uses called de-escalate the situation. Now there are some people who de-escalate a situation. And there are other people who by their nature take a fire and just their presence results in gasoline being thrown all over it. Now I am... I'm more like the latter than the former, but my brother is a great de-escalator. I got a true story to tell you. This, uh, this was two weeks ago, right? Our, we have 18 members of the East Step family on vacation together. We went to Pigeon Forge. And uh, during that week, my brother ends up in the car with his wife, his two sons, who are both now grown. They, the youngest one just graduated college and got married. The two boys and, and the newest member of the family, the daughter-in-law. And they're going to the Tanger Outlets. That poor sap. I made it the entire week without going there at all. And I'm like, that's a vacation. That's what I'm talking about. So the place was real full. Of cars everywhere because it's like 4th of July week. And they're doing these big sales. And hard time finding a parking spot. So he sees, you know, you know you're looking. You, you, you get eagle eyes like in an instant to see somebody walk into their car. Or you can identify those reverse lights in a heartbeat if you're trying to find a parking spot, right? So he sees a guy getting ready to back out. So he just pulls down that aisle and just waits. And it's not a situation where there's a guy on the other end and they're going to race to see who can get there first. No, the guy backs out. He pulls in. And in front of him, right in front of the stores, there's another man um, who's obviously having a very bad day. He's dropping his wife off at the front door of one of the stores. And as soon as my brother Eddie takes that spark parking spot, the guy throws it in the park, jumps out, Start screaming and cussing him. That was my spot. He wasn't even waiting for it. <laughs> so, you know, instantly his heart started racing, his my, being my brother. And the boys, two boys that were college athletes in great shape, they all get out of the car. And my brother, and the guy's screaming and yelling, and my youngest nephew, he's a peacemaker, he's like, hey man, there's a spot like three cars over, it's right there. 
The guy didn't want to have anything to do with that. So he just keeps swearing and yelling and calling him everything but a white boy. And my brother says to the family, let's, let's just go on in. And the guy says, I'm coming after you. And I'm thinking, maybe I should have gone shopping after all. <laughs> So they get, this is a true story. So they go into the store and uh, my brother stops by the door and just waits. Two boys behind him. And I'm thinking the story's going to get really good now. There's going to be a whooping at tang. There's going to be a tangle at the tanger and I missed out on it. So the guy comes in, his wife's standing out on the, on the sidewalk. She's just giving it this number. And, and whenever he first walked in, it caught him off guard. He was just standing there waiting. But it, it didn't slow him down too much. Again, ranting, raving, screaming, cussing. And after a couple minutes of that, my brother stepped forward and said, Sir, I'm sorry. And he didn't know what to do. What do you do when you show up for a fight and they're in the fight? When you want to yell and the other guy doesn't yell back, what do you do? It was over. So in shame... He's shaking his head and his wife's embarrassed out and finally he just walks on out of the store and everybody else has seen what's going on there. I want to tell you, I told my brother when he told that, I'm like, were you packing? (laughs) 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 That's really what I asked him. Uh, And then I said to him, I think it's only the power of the Holy Spirit that can enable somebody to respond the way you responded. Because in the flesh... When somebody wants to fight, bring it on. I mean, some people are by nature, they flight instead of fight. I'm a fight person, unless, of course, it's with Michelle. And then I'm running as far as away as I can get. (laughs) Watch out for the lightning there. Yeah. So the the guy comes to Jesus, and you can tell from the way Luke presents the story, he's He's there to fight. And Jesus de-escalates the situation. He refuses to get involved in that kind of an interaction with him. So he gives him a chance to be right. Now you would think that that might just end the whole story right there. You know, like just like the guy at the outlets, what do you do when they don't want to fight you? Just, well, okay, I'll go on out. But that's not what happened in this story. The expert in the law stuck around. And uh, I think what's taking place is he, he tries to have this battle with Jesus and it doesn't go anywhere. He looks for a fight, he doesn't find it. So then he takes a step back. And what I think is going on here, I could be wrong, but what I really think is happening is that that the unrest that was going on inside of him comes to the forefront. Most of the time when somebody shows up looking for a fight, there's already a fight going on. So here's him. He's an expert in law, right? Remember he got the question right? Love God and love your neighbor. This is the greatest commandment. He knew it. But there must have been something going on in his heart, in his spirit, in his mind that was saying, I know what it says, but I know what I want to do. And what that says, and what I know here, and what I want to do here, is is two different things. So he goes to Jesus looking for justification. Verse 29, let's look at it. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In other words, I got some people in my circle of influence that I don't want to treat like a neighbor because I don't like them very much. You think it'd be okay if I uh, kind of pick and choose who my neighbors are, Jesus? Or better yet, you can do it for me. Luke gives us insight into what's going on in his heart. He doesn't want an answer. He wants to justify himself. And if I've seen anything about my own life and all of yours, is that we're experts at that. We are. We're great at it. We can know what it says and we can feel what we want to do and try to come up with all the different reasons and rationale as to why it's okay for us to do something, behave differently, believe differently than what we know is the truth. And here's what else human beings do. We do this all the time. I've seen it like a z. If I had a dollar for every time I've seen this, I'd be like rich. What we do is we try to find somebody to agree with us. I've seen. Pastor, what do you think about this? Well, here's what I think about that. 
Here's what the Word says. Here's what I think you ought to do. All right. D, what do you think about this? Terry, what do you think about this? Tony, what do you think about this? And there are folks, and I've been one of them, and you've done it too. We will keep, we will keep searching. We'll keep, we'll keep fishing until we try to find somebody who will justify what we want to do. Amen. Or how we want to behave. Let me tell you something. There's always an idiot out there who will agree with you. I'm serious. I mean, you ask enough people, somebody's going to say, yeah, you're right, you're justified. Just go ahead and do it. Let me help you out a little bit. I like to help you. If you're looking for somebody to justify what you already want to do, don't talk to Jesus. Amen. See, that's why some people have trouble with him. When he's the Savior who gave his life and forgives our sins and gives us a place in heaven and all that jazz, whoo, he's awesome. But when what I want to do is a little different than what he's already said and I can't quite get him to see my point of view, then we got problems. And let me tell you something. A life, of, a, a life that is not 100%, all out, everything surrendered and committed to Jesus can be a very miserable life. Because you can't do what you want to do and do what he wants to do at the same time. None of us can. Amen. And what this guy's trying to do is to justify himself so that he gets it right, but he still gets to do his own thing. It does not work that way. It just doesn't. I mean, you can try it, but it doesn't. So he's looking for, he can't find the fight, so he's, he's looking for a loophole. And Jesus, instead of just like giving him a smack down saying, you know better than that. He tells him a story. Beginning with Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Go ahead and turn there if you're not already there and please stand with me and honor the reading of the word. I think I messed up the media and only got like the verse 35 put in there, but I'm going to read through verse 37 on one occasion. Let me just go ahead and read that whole thing again. Kind of catch us up. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place where the man was, saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three, so Jesus comes back to the guy, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. So he tells them the story. One of the most famous stories ever. The story of the Good Samaritan. Now, it's pretty easy for us on this side of things to look at both the Levite and the priest as being, man, they're jerks. Here they are seeing this guy all beat up and laying on the side of the road half dead and they're like, oh, they will go the other way. Of course, none of us have ever done that when we saw that guy holding the thing at the stoplight, but we'll not go there. I've done that. Back to the story. The priest and the Levite. We, we, we kind of paint it as them being bad guys, but here's the choice. They have a choice between fulfilling their duty and fulfilling their duty. On one hand, they're experts in the law too. If you'd asked them the same question, greatest commandment, they would have, boom, love God, love your neighbor. Got that one, check. So they know the law of love. But they got some other stuff working on them too. 
they're probably more than likely on their way to Jerusalem because it's their, their numbers come up and it's their turn to serve in the temple. In order to serve in the temple, you got to be clean. Touching a dead body or somebody that's beat up and bloody and all that business can render them ceremonially unclean. That means I might, be, I might could go on out to the temple in Jerusalem, but when I get there, I can't do my job. And who's that going to help? Nobody. I mean, I'm supposed to go to serve. And that's my duty. That's my responsibility. That's the law. And then you've got the law that's, uh, I'm just making this up, the law of common sense. That was a dangerous road. Everybody knew it. So when Jesus used that road as an example in his parable, it very well could be that, that the folks that were hearing it had heard a story or seen one where somebody was in a ditch and they were the, uh, they were the bait. A plant, a fake. Just acting like they're all beat up and bloodied. And so when a kind person went to show concern for them, boom, out jumps the robbers. They beat them up, take their money, put them in the ditch. And the other guy goes, that was a good acting job. Let's go. Next victim. So it wasn't just do the right thing or do the wrong thing. It was do the right thing or do the right thing. Or do the right thing. Not so easy now, is it? Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you don't know what to do? And it's not just real clear-cut black and white. It might be between duty and duty, responsibility and responsibility, one law and another. Well, what they did was they chose the law of being clean over the law of showing love. So they went on around. Now, the Samaritan, on the other hand, the Samaritan were like, they were the bad guys. Remember the story a couple weeks ago? They were the ones that... Jesus sent his disciples in town and they're like, we don't want to have anything to do with them. And the disciples are like, go down fire, let's light them up. Jesus said, no, no. Next story, he, he turns the Samaritan into the hero. And he says, uh, the Samaritan. Now, look at this scripture. Here's what I want you to look for. Go, if you, I hope you'll, you still have your Bibles open. What all did this Samaritan do that was a tangible, physical, concrete, specific act of love? There's a whole bunch of them. Tell me what they are. So, okay, say it one at a time. Put him on a donkey. Bandage his wounds. Paid for his expenses. He stopped. Yeah. Right. Said I'll pay. I'll, if there's any more expenses incurred, I'll pay that too. Yes. Absolutely. You know, you know this. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not here to tell you anything you don't already know today. I'm here to just kind of remind us all because that's what God's been doing to me through this scripture. We can talk about love all we want to. We can know in our head. Greatest commandment, love God, love your neighbor. We can have it here, like you know, if it was on a quiz. If you know if churches was about, were about quizzes, we'd just study that and be okay. It's not about quizzes, it's about life. And the true test of whether or not we are loving and whether or not we know we're loving, it doesn't happen in the safety and security of this place where everybody's in pretty good shape. It happens out there when we encounter broken, hurting, bleeding, wounded folks. And we have the opportunity to get engaged and to get involved or to walk by on the other side of the road. Amen. That is where it gets revealed. Because we can talk about love in theory. Oh yeah, I love God. I love people. We can talk about it. Or we can show it. See, the cool thing about this is, in that story, the good, and there's all kinds of cool stuff, but never once do you see it come off the lips of the Samaritan, I love you, stranger. And yet, that is a message that is shouted louder than any other because he shows it. Jesus finishes telling the story and he says to the expert, so tell me, which one was the neighbor? And see what he does there? He, re he just, just enough. Because remember what the question was? Who is my neighbor? Jesus' question is, who acted like a neighbor? It's not about you determining who is and is not your neighbor. It's about you living your life every day as a neighbor. Who shows love to people, period. It's a pretty cool pattern. And I didn't see this until reading what somebody else said about this scripture, but somebody said he saw him and he stopped 
the Samaritan did? Here's the pattern. He sees him. He has compassion on him. He meets the need. Do you know that that happens all the way through the Gospels? When Jesus, in chapter 7 in Luke, just a few weeks ago, remember the story of the widow from Nain who lost her son? Jesus encounters them. The crowd that knows Jesus meets up with the crowd that needs Jesus and some big stuff happens. He sees her. He has compassion on her. He raises her dead boy. And look at how he interacts with the crowds. He sees the crowd and he has compassion because they're like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know where they're going. And he teaches them. In another instance, he sees the crowd. He has compassion on them because they are hungry. He meets their need by the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Same thing in Luke 15. The father sees the prodigal son returning. He sees him. He has compassion on him. He runs out to meet him and lavishes love on the boy that had gone wild. I think that's what, I think that's what it means to be a neighbor. See, because all three of the people in the parable, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, all of them saw it. But only one of them saw it. He saw it. He had compassion. And he took action. See, here's the thing that makes this more than just a y'all be nice to people and go back and I'll see you next week. This is not a just be nice to people story. It is a concrete, specific Hands on, this is what love looks like message. And it calls for a concrete, hands on, specific response from everyone in here to go out of this place today and live like a neighbor. Because that's what Jesus calls us to. Cool thing is, that's also what Jesus did. We're going, to have, we're going to celebrate communion in a few minutes, and I love it. I love this place. I mean, we encounter Jesus here. But when, when Christ came, you know, when he, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, when Jesus, the Word who was with God from the beginning, became flesh, took on flesh, and dwelt among us, he did not come to fight with us. You know what he came to do? He came to fight for us. He came to fight the enemy who came to steal and kill and to destroy. He came to fight the one who wants to keep you separated from your relationship with God and all twisted up in your relationships with other people. Jesus came to do battle with an enemy and that enemy was not you. He came not to fight with you. I mean, I hope you know this. The Son of God and Savior of the world left the glory of of his existence with the Father and he came down here among this mess of humanity to fight for you. And there were no loopholes in his approach. John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved what? It doesn't say, for God loved part of the world. For God loved the world of nice people. For God loved the people who would love him back. No loopholes, no exceptions. He loved everybody. And as much as we'd like to say, isn't there that one person that I don't have to include in that list? The answer is no. And then he didn't just say, I love you. showed I love you when the nails were driven into his hands and feet every ringing of that hammer hitting the nail shouted out a message from God I love you every stripe that was laid on his back as he was beaten every Every stream of blood that went flowing down his forehead as the crown of thorns were jammed into his skull shouted a word from God. He wasn't saying it, but he sure was showing it. I love you and you and you and you and you and all of you. And it's the kind of love that doesn't just talk. My brothers and sisters... When we say we sign up to follow Jesus, what we're saying is, 
by the grace of God, we're going to live it like he did. And that's the only way we can live it, by the grace of God. So where does that leave us this morning? Well, I don't know. What are you looking for? Are you looking for a fight? Some folks come to church looking for fights. Some folks go home looking for a fight. Some folks go to work looking for a fight. What are you looking for? Can I just tell you the truth? I mean, I try to do that all the time, but I got to just say this. I, I'm going to get up here where you can see me good. I think, I think that every Sunday in every church in all the world, somebody shows up looking for a loophole. I mean, I'm here. I love God and I want to be everything He wants me to be, but... Can't I just keep? Can't I just stay? Can't I just? No. And today, I think there's maybe at least one person in this house today who needs to stop doing that. If you look for a fight, I mean, you might find one with somebody, but you're not going to find one with Jesus. He's not fighting against you. He's fighting for you. If you're looking for a loophole, I guarantee you, you can find it with somebody, but it's not going to be with him. But if you're looking for an opportunity to show the kind of love Jesus showed to everybody else, I promise you this, you'll find it everywhere you look. Amen. Amen. Everywhere you look. Let's pray. God, you're awesome. Thank you so much for, I don't know, maybe in some cases today you've been revealing some things and in others you've just been reminding us of what we already knew, but... I love your word and I thank you for the way it speaks to us. And Jesus, thanks for being patient with people even when they came before you with less than the best of motives and loving them anyway because probably all of us have been in that category sometime. And we received the same kind of mercy and kindness that you gave the expert. And God, I, I'm grateful today that I know this to be true about you. You want us all to get it right. You do. You're not... I just, I know that you're not waiting in heaven with your big list of all of the things that we've done wrong, just waiting for us to mess up again. You want us to get it right. That's why you gave us your word and your son and your spirit and each other. And Lord, I'm telling you today, I think I'm hoping I'm speaking for all of us. We want to get it right too. So I pray that if there's anybody that's got a turmoil going on in their own heart that needs to be surrendered to you. And if there are any of us who are really struggling because we've got some people that we just as soon write off the list and uh, not include in that neighbor category that they, I think probably if we got them, you're probably bringing them to our mind right now. Amen. And Lord, we want to be a people who go forth into this world as ambassadors and representatives of Jesus who live like the neighbor in this story. And I know beyond any doubt, that's something way bigger than a just go be nice to people message because unless we have Christ in us, we can't do it. Lord, we want Christ in us. Consuming us, filling us, sanctifying us, consecrating us, setting us apart, making us holy so we can live this life of incredible love in the world that so desperately needs to see it. And so I'm praying, Jesus, that as we come to your table, we break this bread and Get a taste from this cup, these tasteable, tangible expressions of your love that you will meet us in this place. I ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.